of how can you integrate those more dynamic things into the planning. We're doing that for mammals, all of the mammals of the Cerrado. And we considered many things. For example, we model species distribution for the time being and for the future. So we know where the species will be in the, in the future. Then we did some kind of, uh, we modeled the dispersal distance this species could have. So we're modeling the maximal dispersal distance to not only to, uh, to understand where the distribution of the species could be, but also how much of the landscape the species can use okay, to disperse to suitable areas. So I can have some kind of suitable areas over there, climatic suitable areas over there, but I, I need to know if the species will be able to get to that place. Okay, so that's why I need to model the maximal dispersal distance so I can say, okay, even if my ecological niche model says, says to me that this is a good place, if the species cannot go there, then this place is useless for conserving the species, okay? So we also have, because <clears throat> we model current and future distribution, we have species turnover in each site. We know that how many species will be there and what are the species. We have the composition of the species of that site. And this give us, gives us some kind of uncertainties. What are the species that will be in that place? Or uh, I'm not sure if the species will actually be on that place because of dispersal limitations and because I have a model. So my model has an error and I should account for this using uncertainty. And then you can have this uncertainty like a cost. I mean the places uh, for which you have high uncertainty, these are not good places to invest in conservation, right? If you're not sure if the species is there, why put in some dollars in that place? It doesn't make sense. So you can have this as a constraint to our analysis. <clears throat> Please try to not pick up sites where I'm not sure if this species will be there. Okay? And then that sounds good, but you're also not sure if the habitat you are trying to protect will be there in the next 80 years. So we, we have also model habitat fragmentation. So we have a future land use and we have included the already established protected areas. So we were actually saying in, in the model that we know where the species will be with some uncertainty related to this. So this is the current uh, species richness pattern for mammals in, in the Brazilian Cerrado. Then we have the future pattern you expect, so more species here in the future. And then you have this level of uncertainty about that information. So you can see that I'm not really sure about what will happen in this region. I have higher uncertainties here. But I'm pretty sure of what will happen here. Okay? So when I say that this place uh, will have a lot of species in the future, I'm pretty sure about that information. But when I'm saying that few species will occupy the north, the northern part of the Cerrado, I'm not really sure about that. Okay? I have more uncertainty in the models here. <clears throat> and then I have this habitat loss projection for each year up to 2080. And you say, this is the current distribution of nature, native veg vegetation in the Cerrado. Dark, dark green is uh, where we have uh, that vegetation. The light green is that it has been vanished. And this is our worst case scenario for the future. We're, we will lose, we expect to lose about 73% of the Cerrado native <laughs> vegetation up to 2080. And then we can combine those information, where the species would be, what are my uncertainties about that information, where the available habitat will be, and if the species will be able to colonize that habitat. And we can try to produce some scenarios of conservation that considers 
all these uh, aspects. So if you take a look at, let's pick up this, can you see this one? Yeah. So here we have the Sahad, we have some green areas here. These are the areas that are already protected in the Sahad. And the red places, the red sites, are the ones that we are telling that are priority for conserving mammals in the Cerrado, considering the range shift in species distribution, the uncertainty about this information, the changes in habitat availability, the species specific dispersal capabilities, habitat connectivity, and network design. And habitat connectivity is because we are aggregating cells, so we will minimize the distance these species will need to cover to get to another suitable place if the place uh, it was uh, before is not suitable anymore. Okay? So all this go goes here. And if you sum up the green and the red areas, you will end up with 17% of the Brazilian Cerrado protected, which is the Aichi target that Brazil has signed in the Convention of Biological Diversity in Nagoya, in Japan, okay? So you can actually have a lot of dynamic things here, like range shifts, um, habitat loss, species dispersal distance included in the same plan to offer the decision-making a portfolio of solutions that he or she can look at and be assured that that will be the best decision I can make at this time, okay? But again, this is an academic er exercise. We only did that for mammals. And we should obviously do that for a whole range of biodiversity features, okay? If we're actually trying to implement that as a conservation plan into the Brazilian Serra. Then you can have more creative ideas. For example, uh, Brazil has another very interesting biome that we call the Pantanal. It is a flooded region. It has a very uh, consistent flood pulse. Half of the year it is very dry, and half of the year it is underwater. Okay? And then you have biodiversity responding to that kind of, um, of ecosystem processes. <clears throat> so these guys, Reinaldo Lourival and colleagues, they did a very interesting work, and they were trying to predict what will be the plant composition of each of, of these sites. Each grid cell here is a different site in the Brazilian Pantanal. And then have this huge time series of uh, flood posts in the Pantanal. So they have historical records for each of these cells that says to them that, well, that cell went to one dry ear and then it went back to a wet ear. That would be <clears throat> the most common thing. One ear dry, one ear wet. But there are some places in the Pantanal that you can have one, three, five, maybe seven dry ears consecutively and that area will not be totally flooded. And then you can have time going back and the area is getting flooded in different times. So the thing is, if you have some type of plant community here and you have a very dry ear, you will have some kind of <coughs> uh, ecological uh, changes that will change the community. Okay? And the community will end up being another one. You have some species turnover, and it will change the whole community from a very wet community with aquatic plants, for example, to more kind of a grassland community in dry places, right? And if you have three more years of dry period, then we'll have another community with some bushes, maybe some small trees, okay? So you have this gradient of community change. And then that same community that resembles a grassland or something like that, if it gets a very wet ear and uh, is underwater, it could go back to the initial stage 
and be mostly composed by aquatic plants, right? So they have historical records of that thing. They know what happened for the last 120 years in that particular place. And then they are able to predict what will be the community that the place should uh, show if the Pantanal behaves like that. So they have one, two, three, four, five types of different communities that you can find in the Pantanal. And they're mapping these types, these types of community here. So here is the invader aquatic community, some kind of endurer hydrophilic community, up to this uh, mesic uh, climax community, right? So what they did is to run a model, a matrix model, Markov change, trying to predict what will be, based on historical records of flooding, what will be the community in the future if we run that matrix through, say, 50 years from now on. So then they could predict what will be the community in the future, and they can make a conservation plan based on that. So it's pretty much like uh, discussing the effects of climate change, but they, they are trying to understand how community will change in time because of an other ecological, geological process that is flooding in the Pantanal. Okay? But you can include this kind of dynamic system in the prioritization. <clears throat> so spatial planning cannot, uh, it's, spatial planning is not a static problem, it is a dynamic problem, and you also cannot ignore the uncertainties in have. So we, we have developed a lot of interesting tools to understand, to model species distribution, and now we can measure the uncertainty associated with these methods and those models, and we can also map the uncertainty. I can say to you that uncertainty, for example, this is for more than 3,000 bird species that we have modeled for the new world, and I can say that the uncertainty arising from the, the modeling method you use, it could be Maxent, GARP, Euclidean distance, <coughs> artificial neural networks, so the uncertainty arising from the models are higher here, for example, in the Brazilian Amazon, or here in southern US than in other places. And we can partition this kind of uncertainty to different types or sources of uncertainty. And I can say to you, for example, that uncertainty arising from future climate projections will be higher here than here, okay? And we can do that for different <clears throat> a greenhouse gases emission scenarios or different type of model parameterization. You can just do that, measure the uncertainty, and map the uncertainty. You can understand that. Then you can obviously <clears throat> have a model of a species distribution and the associated uncertainties with that, what is the widest of the confidence interval you have on your information about the species occurrence. And you can make some kind of prioritization trying to select places with high certainty of your information and trying to avoid those places with high uncertainty. Okay? You, you can, you can miss uh, some targets if you are allocating your resources to places in which you are not certain about this species occurrence, right? So you can't ignore uncertainties while doing this kind of planning. <clears throat> and I'm talking about ecological niche modeling because it's one of the, the research uh, lines we have there in Brazil. But you can, it, when you're trying to use any kind of model in conservation planning, you will have some kind of uncertainty. So this is a, not a kind of uncertainty, this is a map of the global richness pattern for mammals in the world. And this has been uh, <clears throat> done with the, those IUCN polygons, IUCN range maps that you have available on the Red List website. 
But then you can do some type of habitat suitability model. So you are discounting from the range the sites that you actually know the species is not there. Could be a city or a particular kind of elevation, a habitat that is not suitable for the species. You can discount this, this from ranges and you have a new map that's kind of this. The whole pattern will obviously be mostly the same, but if you, you downgrade to a more regional scale or local scale, effects and differences between those two maps can be huge. And there is the uncertainty. I don't know exactly where this species is. Okay, we should not ignore the risks and threats these species have. And that risk is usually spatially and geographically structured. So there are some places in, on Earth that imposes more risk to species than, than other ones, okay? And species threat is a, a tricky thing because you can have some kind of uh, different pathways to extinction of species and a huge part of that, that, that pathway could be only because of intrinsic variables. So the biology of the species can predispose it to go extinct. And it's very easy to think about a large carnivore and a small rodent. Of course, the large carnivore will be at higher risk, okay? It has, it has a larger body size, it preys upon a uh, few uh, preys, it has a low litter size compared to, to the rodent. It means that the population is much less resilient than the population of a rodent. <clears throat> so the thing is that different types of intrinsic biological variables like the total geographic range of the species, the body mass, the population density, or maybe the type of uh, habitat, if it is arboreal or terrestrial, it can define the risk the species is facing. And it should be included in the planning. It, should be, it can be included in a very simple fashion, like you can use the status that the IUCN red list give to you about the species, and you're then considering the threats the species have, and you can give a particular weight to the species. So if the species is highly threatened, you give it more weight. You're saying that it is more important to preserve that species than to protect this, any species that is of least concern, okay? But you can also model extinction risk and try to identify some kind of continuous values of extinction risk that you can use to do your conservation planning, okay? And this, this particular example from Anna Davidson, Davidson and colleagues is for intrinsic biological features, but then you have all the extrinsic factors, mainly anthropogenic, and you can have some kind of latent Extinction, extinction risk. So, the species is, will not be threatened by its biology, but it happens that habitat loss makes that species vulnerable, okay? Or it could be uh, the other way around. The species is actually threatened by, um, is not actually threatened, but from the biology, we can understand that the species is well predisposed to be threatened, and if we don't do anything right now, the species could be extinct in the future, okay? So we should map that. And of course, we can't ignore the economic costs of establishing conservation, of doing conservation actions. This is perhaps the most important thing, and we have some groups, especially in Australia, that has been working with this for more than 20 years. They're trying to understand what are the effects of including costs in conservation planning. And this is of pretty much importance because if you have an interesting conservation plan, but the cost is too high, it will not be implemented. And it could be an economic cost, it's simply not feasible for the stakeholders trying to do that. 
but you can have also those social costs or political costs, and it's not interesting in that particular moment for politicians to do that. Or it's no good for the community that lives in the area you are trying to protect. 